vegetable harvest and all kinds of fun things. So um, let's pray and we're going to get started. Father, thank you today that your word is alive and powerful and it creates uh, hope in lives. And um, I would love for you just to minister to each one of your children right where they are. This subject I know can be either really hopeful or really hard. And so I'm asking you today to bring new life to places that are dead. Give joy where there's maybe been hopelessness. And revive those in, in, in hard places, in good places. We ask for you to just be with us in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the garden long ago, it wasn't good that man should be alone. Okay, all you guys, do you like having a woman around? <laughs> yes. Oh, it was a loud yes. Go, Micah, go. I love it. So it wasn't good. He needed, he, it was God's idea to make us a suitable helper, someone that could walk a long life's journey with us and, and um, we, you know, would have two social securities instead of one. So, you know, I, like it just kind of, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of good things. Yesterday I had the opportunity of meeting with a young couple that's getting married this summer with, you know, dreams in their eyes, hopes in their, you know, hopes in their heart. And at the same, in about an hour and a half later right here before the canoe, we had the opportunity to see someone renew their vows after 50 years of marriage. So what a, you know, what a, a, a contrast there. Someone jumping into the water and someone still swimming around in the water, right? There's still some, you know. And um, so we, I got to see that, reaffirming love after 50 years. And so... Um, so when we, we have that first date, I'm kinda, I kind of wanted to talk to some of the younger people that haven't had this experience yet. How do you know? Because that's one of the questions I asked a lot. How do you know? Like, what do you do when you find some? You know, what do you, you know, because you see a lot of things that maybe aren't um, what God has. But God has marriage, and he instituted it. And so we should be successful at it. Um, so we're going to go from that first date uh, and, and walk this journey with some of you that I know, like, eventually would like to be married, would like to um, find someone. And then some of you would like to actually stay married. <laughs> Once you get married, well, you'd like to stay married. So I'm kind of hoping that we're going to go all the way through to family in just a short, brief time. Um, so let's begin with with our, um, I'm going to do this version, 1 Corinthians, um, there we go, there it is, in chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, it says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. This is the main emphasis here that I wanted to look at in this verse or this, this portion of, is this verse, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil, but does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. Love never fails. 
continuing in that verse, but where there are prophecies, they'll fail. Where there are tongues, they'll cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and yet we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put off childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And so I wanted to read that whole passage for you to realize I've been teaching on the spiritual gifts. I've been teaching, you know, on fruit of the spirit. And so with that, I wanted to focus in on what is love? What is it? What is it about love? Some of these things that we think we are teaching on, they're going to pass away. Right. Why? Why are they going to pass away? Because eventually we'll be with him. We're not going to speak for him. Because we will know him. He can talk right to my face. I don't need anybody else to help me hear God at that time, right? While I'm here, I better ask for some help. I need help. I need people to come alongside me. So um, what is it about marriages that work? I've been married 32 years. It's been pretty good. It gets better usually each year. I mean, year seven, I always say, was a bad year. I didn't like that one. But, you know, after year seven, we got through some things, and we kind of, you know, we worked it out. But, boy, year one was, you know, sometimes a little bit, you know, because you're, you're trying to live a life being challenged by really God put us in marriage. It's a mystery. But it was to help us know how him and the church would relate to each other how we would actually have somebody see us up close and personal in our life, have to help us change at times, which that's not the fun part. Um, and that's why sometimes there can be some conflict. It's like I didn't get into marriage thinking that I could stay the same. I got into marriage knowing that it wasn't, I was going to have to change. Because someone was going to see all of this and say, hey, you know what? You're a little selfish. You know what? You're a little cranky. You know what? You have a temper. And not because they're pointing stuff out. It's just when you live. And you're going to have to say the same thing back to them. Hey, let's work on this. Let's go together. Let's pray about it. Let, you know. Maybe you have to say, you're a slob, and I'm neat. <laughs> like, we need to work on this. Guess what? That marriage is going to help you to get better if you let it. Or you, it can destroy you if you don't. So as we're walking in this life, um, uh, you're going to have to have some goals, some things to work towards to achieve. Not just, not just like we want to get a house someday. But what do we want to work on in here? What, what goals do I have of being kind, of not being under pressure to buy impulsively, to uh, financially put myself in debt that I can't afford? You know, So those are some things that we're, those will show what needs to be worked on by being married. Those were things my mother couldn't teach me. Those were things, you know, that... My grandmother, you know, those were some great things that they did teach me, but it wasn't that. You need a family to tell you, like, hey, that wasn't quite, you know, maybe. And we don't like to hear it, do we? That's why one of the things, I looked up the word submission in Google. Don't ever do it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and I was like, man, what a sad state. To, if you look up that word in Google, it has everything from, um, I, don't, I don't even want to say it. It's just not even godly. But the true submission means like, hey, I'm going to, and, and it goes both ways, both to husband and wife. It's not one 
over the other. Like, you know, w- w- men is the head of the house, but he's, I mean, it's going to be as an act of your will. It's not, never a demand. It's a joy to be able to, you know what, you probably have this right, and I'm, you know, there'll be times like that. And it'll be that he's going to love you and walk with you in some things that maybe when you're, you know, weak in. And so I, wa- I wanted to just go back to how do we make it work? How do we get this total, this total commitment for your total life? Um, and so when we see why, why do I, how do I avoid divorce? I avoid a hard heart. And so we don't give in to when our heart starts to get hard. Uh, it gets it's sneaky. And sometimes it masks itself as justice. I'm justified in this. And that's where, that begins to say, give you the hard heart. You didn't do for me, you know. Um, And it can begin to develop a hard heart. So let's not give in to this. It can also mask his self-righteousness. Lord, I'm doing all this and he's not doing anything. Why don't you deal with him? And that, that becomes like a, a self-righteous thing, and that can harden your heart, according to Matthew 19, 8, and 9. So you can be really right and be really wrong. Maybe there is some, some justice that needs to be done. And that could be right, but let God deal with that. Don't, don't begin to harden your heart against the person that you loved and are committed to. Um, so why am I saying this? So we brought this canoe here for you because this canoe my son-in-law found in an old ranch in North Austin with his buddy and climbed in, was it a dry pond? No wet pond? Ew, gross. And, 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 And rescued it. He brought it out of this old pond. It was abandoned. Okay, and this developer was developing this land, and he it was full of holes. It wouldn't have it wouldn't have been able to get on the water, and he decided him and his buddy got it out. Kirk and him got it out, and they they brought it to Fredericksburg. Why? I don't know, because he saw value in some junk. You know, he saw some value in it, and do you know what? That apple didn't fall far from the tree because, you know what, his dad saw some value in this. And this old canoe that was dug out of a bunch of mud and left for nothing uh, was uh, brought home, and, and, and Eric Mustard actually repaired it for a wedding gift for them. And do you know... This wasn't the canoe that you rode to, in, to propose to her, right? No. I wish it was. That would make a great story. <laughs> but uh, at Lake Travis, we were all on a boat, and we were waiting, and Michael and Maddie rode across Lake Travis in a, in a different canoe, and um, he proposed to her there. And then this was given as a wedding gift for them, a repaired, not a new canoe, a repaired canoe. And so what I love about this is that it takes generations. It takes parents. It takes kids. It takes to the next generation to see value in things. And so as we're, as we're seeing value, you're training the next generation. So sometimes I see things as junk. Ask my kids. It happened this week. <laughs> I was guilty as charged. And I'm going to have to spend some money to replace what I thought was junk. So, um, because this generation didn't take interest in what I didn't realize what I had was valuable to somebody. And sometimes we have things in, that we might think are no good. But I want to tell you, God sees the perspective of whether it's somebody jumping in a pond to rescue something or someone, like, not honoring someone else's treasure. 
We all have those times, and what do you do with those? When things don't go right, when someone didn't honor your treasure, and um, so we're showing that things are either valuable or worthless with what we do, what we say, how we act, every day of our life. It's in the little things. I, 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 love, um, I love it when um, I don't have to put gas in my car. You know, being a single woman for this last month, it's been kind of fun, but uh, <laughs> not really. Um, there's a lot of things that I had to muster up strength within. Some of you who are widows, you've had to muster up some strength that you didn't know you could have alone. Or single, maybe you've gone through a divorce. There's some strength that you have to, there's, you have to pull up out and be that you didn't know you had when you have somebody helping you along the journey. And so it gives you a different perspective. It helps you go, whoa, there might be some things that I need to, to speak life to that I need to revive when I've taken for granted. And um, in that process, almost like rehabbing the canoe. Where in your life are there some holes that maybe you've, or you've found holes in somebody else? <laughs> and like, oh, well, you're broken there. And, and, but how do we fix that? How do we see the value and make something? Because this is really pretty now. I can't imagine this being tossed away because it still has value, but it takes skill. It takes time to work on stuff that needs work. And so even if it looks like you ca it can't be repaired, what would you think if, like, if a boat has a hole, can that be repaired? In my mind, no. In the natural because I don't have any skill at repairing boats. But when you have some skill in that, you can pull from that. Pull from the strength that God can give you when you need it. When, it's, when life has holes. Things that you didn't deserve. Things that you never asked for. Things you didn't want to walk through. And, there, and it tears away at the places where God wants to repair and he wants to use other people to help repair those things. It can come through the preaching of the word. It can come through a kind word of somebody, you know, maybe even sitting next to you. When we build that up and we build and we let God work, um, we know that communication can be a challenge. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that. I felt like today was kind of the day to kind of hone in on a little bit of communication. Um, and... Uh, help you with that, help me with that. Um, let's look at that same passage of 1 Corinthians in the New Living Translation. Just a, por a portion of that, verses 4. Um, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. Oh, I'm going to repeat that. And it keeps no record of being wronged. Yeah, you were wronged. But we choose to let it go. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstances. circumstance. Those are some of the words that sometimes I have to put in my mouth when I'm whatever. I like to tell them myself because I don't want to tell on you, but sometimes I have to tell myself, Christine Burdick, you are patient. Christine Burdick, you are kind. Christine Burdick, you're not jealous. I'm not going to be boastful. I'm not going to be proud. I'm not going to be rude. I'm not going to demand my own way. 
So sometimes I just use one of those words. I'm not irritable. <laughs> you know, I'm not easily irritated. So you might have to help yourself. Those are some ways that I help myself. In this, in this verse 8, it says, Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. So this is also showing me that we're going to have to communicate some things here um, verbally uh, and challenge ourselves when we are the opposite. When we're angry, we're going to have to call for peace. When, we, when we're disappointed, we're going to have to call for joy. So if you're looking for a first date, sometimes the, people are so shiny and new. Like, I, I don't know. I wouldn't know how to do this um, dating apps. Like, that would be really hard for me because you're just getting a picture and what they want you to know about them. Um, and, uh, and then I, 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 my kids have told me you swipe one way is a good thing and you swipe another way is no good or something like that. Like you, this means yes, this means no. I don't know. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and, um, but they've never opened their mouth, right? So you have a picture, you have a bio of somebody um, is my assumption, but you've never actually talked to them. So there's no conflict, there's no conflict in here and here if nobody's ever opened their mouth, right? So you get together and you sit down at a table and you start talking to each other and, and um, you find out there's something about them that you're kind of like, ooh, okay, I didn't know that about you. So, so some things start to kind of go, huh, I don't, I, don't, I don't like that. Or, you know, maybe their belief system. Maybe they're not a Christian. Maybe you find out they, you know, they, maybe they don't believe anything like you believe. Uh, maybe they, uh, you know, are, are foul-mouthed and you don't like that. So while it's new and shiny, it's impossible to, to have hurt feelings or break trust. Or um, you're not going to have to uh, admit any fault or... You know, there's not going to be any pride there at that point, right? You're not going to be roused at, at when it's new. It's when there's commitment. It's when there's get through. It's when there's, you know, you're climbing through the lake to get this thing out of the mud. You're committed then. You're committed then. And so as the commitment goes, when things don't go as you like, uh, not everything that we can do to fix it is going to get done before you get married. I'm sorry to tell you. You found Mr. Right. He's perfect. Well, he hasn't fixed everything before he gets married. We can try to work on us. I mean, that's all we can do is work on us. But they're not, you're not perfect. You're going to enter something, and you're going to end up in realizing that um, just because you said yes to the dress is not going to be the end, okay? There's going to be, it's, this is a permanent commitment before God. And you do this as an act of your will. It's voluntary. And you're going to have to learn how to believe the best when really you don't even know them completely yet. You're going to have to listen and, 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 and be willing to change some things when maybe your character is coming out that isn't part of what God's word would want you to do. So what happens when you find a person and there's an attraction? You're going to get some new skills are going to be required. You're going to have to work on some things. You're going to get, learn how to communicate. So... This is going to be that process that verbally you're sharing information with one another in such a way that he or she is understanding what you're saying. Have you ever been misunderstood? Uh-huh. <laughs> Terribly, right? And so when we're communicating, what, what's involved in that is that there's talking. You're going to have to share, share, and we're going to talk about how to. We're going to have to listen. 
and this is with anybody. This can be coworkers, but with, usually that you're not talking deep stuff with your coworkers. Usually, I mean, you're on the clock. You probably shouldn't be, but if you go after work and have dinner or something, then you might. So there's gonna be talking. There's gonna be listening, and then there's gonna be the understanding portion of it. So those three things. So your part, you, so in communicating, uh, you're going to make sure that that person understands what you are saying. How do you make somebody, how do you know if somebody else understands what you are saying? You're going to, so I sometimes, if I've communicated it to you, I think you got it. <laughs> right? Right? But what's in here and what comes out here doesn't always translate to you know what I'm thinking and saying. And sometimes what I'm thinking and what I'm saying might not be exactly what I said. I could think that I'm saying one thing. So we have to find out when we're in relationship, it's, it's imperative that we realize that we're not just talking, we're communicating. We're, it's a back and forth. It's, under, it's, it's bringing understanding to um, that process, that, that verbal sharing information with another person in a way that he or she understands what you're saying. We wanna, we're real quick to blame you. I said this, but your intention didn't want me. You didn't try to get me to understand you didn't, what you were really saying. So we have to talk. We have to listen. We have to understand so that we make sure that person is understanding what we're saying. So um, it is easy for people who uh, are listening to not understand what you're saying. So make sure they do. So I'm going to give you a couple of little points here. Communication is going to send out six messages. <laughs> here we go. You're going to have to, when you're communicating, um, share with that person, you're going to have to know. Uh, you're going to have to know what you mean to say before you say it. What do you want to communicate? Especially if it's something from your heart, out of your heart. Sometimes we talk just to talk. Especially ladies, we just kind of we have a lot of words we want to share with people. So much that sometimes you don't even remember what you say. Okay, so. I'm not going to throw that one on you guys, but I'm going to do a different one for y'all. Yeah. So you have to mean what you say. You're going to have to, and you're, you, what, uh, you're going to have to know that what you actually said, they understood. Sometimes we use a thing called mirroring. So what I think I heard you say was, and you in, when we do counseling, is, is to learn how to say back to that person what they said to you so that they understand. Teach that to your kids. You know, don't just say, I said do this. And so we came from, a lot of us came from that generation is what we were told what to do and we never had to regurgitate anything. We don't even know if they had the meaning. All that we knew is that if you didn't, there was a serious penalty and it hurt really bad. And so you just did it, no questions asked, whether you understood or not. And then you tried to do it, you did understand, and you probably still got in trouble. But so we're, we're, we're trying to actually find out, like, are we communicating? Are we listening? You know, do you know what they actually said? And then do you know what the other person actually heard when you're talking? You don't know unless you ask about it. That's the real part of communication. That's your really, there's that dialogue going back and forth. And then there's the <laughs> this aspect, what the other person thinks they heard. How many times do you go, like, that's not at all what I said. Like, and in their mind, they're seeing something play out. When you told them, they visually had an idea. You know, you could say, well, we went walking through the park. Well, they actually saw, well, you grabbed their hand and you walked with them. When you didn't say that. But it's just because we can interpret something. Like if you say, you, you, know, you put yourself there in a very simple illustration and you can add to it with pictures. 
right? So we need to know what the other person hears. And how does this happen? This is dialogue. You're going to make sure people understand. And this doesn't mean every little detail. I'm not talking about. But what you also have to know what the other person says about what you said. So they can repeat it back to you. Say it back to me. Tell me what you heard me say. And what you think the other person said about what you said. <laughs> so then you're going to have to think about what, okay, what did they say that I said? And so we're, in order to keep things pure, communication is going to have to be a way that we're not only, we're actively listening, but we're asking questions, that we're responding well to one another, that um, it isn't just, um, it isn't just a, a blast and then I said my piece, and let's go on. How many of you are blasters? Don't raise your hand. No, <laughs> you just spit it all out there, and then ugh, I'm done. You know, and you think that they should have got everything that you you meant by that. So when in communication, you're going to have to. If you're a blaster, and you like you say all your feelings, and all you, and you're all hyped up with emotions, you're going to actually have to. Probably repent <laughs> and ask forgiveness because you're not going to say it with the right meaning. You need to be able to, to, to ask back. So love is amazing. It's the greatest thing we can do. Um, but we need to remember, like, don't get ahead. Don't, don't cast your pearl before swine if you're in, a, in, a, in that new relationship. Take it slow. Learn how to make sure that you have a, someone that's really going to communicate well with you. And grow in that and want to grow in that. Um, the scripture where I was reading earlier about hard, not hardening, communication can be a place where we really harden, especially in time. The longer you're married, um, I think that that can be sometimes like, oh, I know what he's thinking. I know what she's thinking. And, and we can kind of take for granted and not even ask. Um, and you'll be challenged in this. And you'll need to change some things. And if you don't want to change, don't get married. If you don't want to change, don't get saved. Because it requires submission to God. It requires a living from his word. And you will be required to change. So when we begin, when we are married and we're, we're going through life and we start adding these cute little kiddos and their godly offspring um, that, that are going to just bless our lives even more. I had, I had a picture here because this is what I always saw my kids um, in my life. I always had uh, this idea of them being little boats. So I don't have a boat painting, but I always admire boat paintings, especially any of them that had three boats in them. Because I always felt like, okay, Michael and I, we have this life, and it's good, and we've had these children, and we're, and we're putting God's word into them, and we're trying to help them learn to be good communicators. But I was, I was young when I got married, and I probably could have grown a lot more. I love that you know, my kids are older when they got married, and they are actually way better parents than I will ever be um, because they, were, they know how to say things so kindly, and they're not you know, quite as emotional. Um, and... Uh, and so my kids, I always felt like I was making them like a boat. Like I was in their lives, that I was creating these kids that were boats. And that I was going to one day put them out on the water and kind of launch them out. And that they would be able to float. And that they would be able to do life and, and enjoy their life. And boy, I knew that, you know, they would create, as we created these vessels, that they would go out and that and they would be carried on different different seas different lakes and uh that they I wanted them to have smooth sailing knowing that there would be storms that would come and at times they would be tossed and teaching them how to have a, the anchor for those valuable hard moments is the word of god and jesus is the anchor of our soul cuz you don't want to have a boat without an anchor you know i I, you, I don't want to go. I mean, I want, you need to know if there's a storm coming, you're going to need some anchors. Because Hebrews 6 tells us about this. It sa says, now when people take an oath, 
they call on someone greater than themselves to hold, hold them to it. And without any question, the oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that when those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. And this love of God, this love, it, it is uh, the Holy Spirit. It's, it's an anchor to know that we, we have um, uh, this anchor for our soul in him, that he leads us by Jesus, that we do have eternal life that we do have relationship with him, that we have this place past that inner curtain to the inner sanctuary, the intimacy that comes from drawing near to him in, in the good, the bad, the ugly individually. But then yet it, it also shows the secret place of the intimacy of God um, by being in a, in a union in marriage that brings us that, that same kind of anchor, knowing that God is with us, that God is both male and female, that God is, is, has the attributes of man and attributes of woman. He puts us together, and it shows the mystery of Christ in the church and how he wanted communion. He wanted relationship. And so this commitment is going to take place and you will grow as you anchor in him, the anchor of your soul. And uh, on this um, vacation here, um, oh, they get, I think there's one more picture. Yeah, there it is. That's a, that's a th clear picture. So in Kenny Bunk, um, there's Kenny Bunk Port and there's Kenny Bunk. This is Kenny Bunk. And um, it's down the road. It's just look at that. Isn't that just amazing? Um, we went with Kate and Curtis and, and, and Owen. He was about a year old, and we were on the East Coast. Curtis showed us all the places that he used to live, where he went to school, and um, it was really fun and got to share that with us, uh, his life. And um, on this beautiful fall day in New England, uh, I was looking at the water, and I saw these three boats tied together. And I realized uh, this just it ministered to me, and I just felt the Lord speak to me that I had fulfilled, in at least this first child, my job as a mom um, who was married with a one-year-old grandson and a brother on the way, and um, that put, I had put my boat on the water, and that she was floating and um, on the lake with him. And she was going to now catch fish. She's going to raise fish. <laughs> and he's wanting us to be a fisher of men. And he wants us to work in our families. He wants us to have a good life. And I am no fisherman. I have actually asked somebody to help me learn how to fish. And my husband's not a great fisherman. If you really look at these poles, I think there was a zip tie on one. I mean, I had to, like, there was tape on one. I cleaned it up a little bit because I was, didn't want him to be embarrassed that we had such terrible fishing poles. But, um, so I, but you, you can be, you, you can have a call on your life. to do great things for God, and the enemy comes and, and wants to take out the things that are good and let you focus on those things that aren't right, the, the old pole, the not good pole, you know. I don't even know. I was like, oh, I wonder if this brand, and I'm like, no, nah, I'm surely not. This is, you know. Um, you can get yourself hurt trying to do things going outside. I mean, I hooked my dress to the to the to the hook there, and you know, kind of ripped it a little bit. But you know, I mean, you can get yourself entrapped in things. He wanted you. He's called us to be fishers of men. Part of that has to do with raising our own family. A lot of it has to do with your own family. 
Um, it can be with your friends and your coworkers, your neighbors. But, but I really feel like there's a solid call on families to grow them up, to develop them. And from that family to reach others for Christ. But the most important, important duties are within our home. And I believe that you're called to this. And you, can, and you can raise a good family if that's in your heart. If it's not, that's okay too. Um, if you want to be single, be single. And do, you know, and that's okay too. But live holy for the Lord. Live as he's called you to. And so um, some of you just need to be help to someone to be a lifeboat. There are people out there that are looking for someone to rescue and help them come to the Lord. Some people out there need you to be a cruise ship. Gosh, I want to be that. A cruise ship for them to help them learn how to keep the Sabbath, to help them learn how to enjoy God and come to the table when they have no money to eat, to come to that cruise ship table and get two dinners if they need to. Some people just need to know that God is so gracious and benevolent, that he cares, that he's abundant, that he wants you to, to, to enjoy him and sit with him. Maybe God's calling you to be like a yacht owner. I think that's pretty cool because he tells people to go out to the highways and the byways and the ports and to come in, those who need Jesus. Like, get on my boat. Let's do this. Marriage is about the kingdom. Marriage is about the things of God, walking in love. And so... You might need a place in your life where you, maybe your life and your, your boat has holes. Maybe your love walk needs to be patched. Life can be pretty hard on you. And the Savior loves and cares for you. He does. He didn't come to save us to not care about how you're doing, how you walk this life out. So even as we come to him, we need to, to rededicate back like, Lord, I've been, I've been burned. I've been hurt. Life hurts. Fix my boat. Help me get called out there to do what you'd have me to do. What part of the fleet am I? Am I the kayak, the canoe, the lifeboat, whatever it is? And he has that for you. And he wants it for you. In Romans 5, it says, we can rejoice, too, when we run into problems. Romans 5, 3. I'm going fast, sorry. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. This is showing us that when we run into problems, we don't look at them and run away from them. We hit them. We, we don't deny them, but we don't allow them to rule every part of our emotional part. And that can be a struggle if you're, you know, if you, you, uh, see things that have hurt you and you, you just don't recover from them. And sometimes it takes time, but in that endurance, you're going to develop strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation and this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he gave us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love when we were utterly helpless Christ came and just the right time and died for us sinners now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good but God showed that his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners and allowed us to be put into his family, in his kingdom, on his ark. You know, I mean, there was a salvation ark that he showed that would rescue a family from utter destruction. And maybe your family needs some rescuing. God's here for that. God wants it for you. And so don't ever lose hope to keep 
push, pushing and persevering to fix things that are broken. Don't just leave broken things. Don't just leave them broken. Ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, how can I fix what seems to be like we can't get through? I remember years ago, Michael and I, we were, we were in a place where we were like, ah, oh, we just couldn't get past a conflict. And I couldn't hear him, and he couldn't hear me. And it just was like a conflict that was one of these times where it's like, I need a third party. I'm not talking to you until we get somebody else in between because I don't hear you and you don't hear me because I only see my side of the story and he only sees his side of the story. And we had to get somebody that loves us. And, and we, we called and said, hey, Pastor, we, it was Pastor Trey. Pastor Trey, can you just, and he's like, I'm coming. He drove three hours. And it's like, let's get through this. And it didn't take that long. But he's like, I see your side and I see your side and you two don't see each other's side. So let's walk through this. And you know what? It was really nice to have somebody that loves you and cares for you that'll just help push you through when conflict, it doesn't mean that, that it's not ever going to happen, but when it does, don't, don't just be an island under yourself. If you can't get through it, people that love you will help you and, 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 and root for you and say, God's got this and pray for you, and you feel so silly afterwards, but it's okay. We were never meant to do life alone. We were never meant that we could just handle it all, and um, there's, a, there's a, a, a country song that sometimes I sing to one of my daughters. Um, uh, it, it says, hide your crazy and start acting like a lady because I raised you better. Get it together, you know. And so sometimes you just kind of have to have those moments where you're like, hide your crazy and act like a lady. But then there's other times where you're like, you know what? I am acting crazy right now. I need some help. And God, he's faithful to help. That's why we have people in our life. We don't always just have to look good. We have to be good, you know. And uh, maybe your mom would tell you to look, you know, just just get it together. Um, but know that God wants more than just your outside. He wants the inside. Why don't you stand with me and we'll pray. Father, we thank you that you totally love us so much. Help us to be good communicators. Help us to effectively communicate with one another so that we don't hurt or offend each other. And Father, then I also ask you that we wouldn't be so touchy when someone does have a grievance with us. That we would learn how to not take it personally, but just see maybe there's something in us that isn't understanding. God, I ask you for your families and your people, Lord, to, to not feel hopeless. Lord, that they would dedicate themselves to, to trying to understand each other with words and believe the best when it almost hurts. Lord, if there's anyone here today that is just struggling, I ask for you to fill their, their holes today. I ask you to help them. Be repaired. And I ask for other people in their family that would help repair those places so that they can float again, so that they can see your goodness in the land of the living, that they might in, encounter your spirit. Holy Spirit, in just comfort, bless, unify all the areas with children, with people looking to get married. I pray they wouldn't make a mistake. They would follow you every step of the way. When there's been disappointment after disappointment, 
I pray, God, that eventually they're going to have the desires of their heart. So we pray your blessing, your anointing on each person as they go to go through their week, that you would show them the beauty of your creation, your blue bonnets, your green budding trees, and that they would see nature just preparing even for your return. And they would examine themselves and just be people of repentance, all of us, just to be people of repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer for anything, we are here for you, to pray with you, to walk you through. If this message ministered to you, um, just we'd love to just pray, agree with those things that it, it hit on for you today. Amen.